Hello and welcome back to AP Environmental Science. Today I want to talk a little bit about geologic hazards uh, and in doing that we're going to talk a little bit about how the processes of the earth work. Um, but let's start out by talking a little bit about the layers. First of all we have the ones that we're familiar with, the crust, the mantle, and the core. But it turns out that there are actually divisions in that. Uh, we have the crust and everything that we're talking about, everything that we do, everything that we know happens in and on the crust, right? Then there is this little layer uh, that's in between the crust and the mantle which is called the Mohovic and it is, if you imagine the crust like a big glass ball, the the Mohovic layer, the Moho, is like saran wrap, right? And then the mantle is kind of like really hot jello. Um, and so the mantle is divided, and these are divided by temperature, and they are also divided by um, composition, right? The upper mantle obviously is cooler than the lower mantle. As you get closer to the core, you get hotter, of course. And then there's the outer core and the inner core, and the inner core is solid due to all of the pressure, even though it has really high temperatures. Now, uh, this is all going to be very important in just a moment. But first, here's your first question. What is the most abundant element on Earth? Well, this might come as a surprise. It turns out that it's actually oxygen. Uh, oxygen you'll find in lots and lots of compounds and molecules. It's pretty much everywhere, so that is the answer. Now, when we start looking at the chemical composition, you can see the crust has all of the expected things, your metals, oxygen, right? Uh, and then the mantle, a great deal of that are the silicate materials. And so you're going to find a lot of silicon of course it's silicate so there's oxygen there as well and then the core is going to be metal it's mostly iron and nickel and it's uh, interesting because you have the solid inner core a liquid outer core then you have a rigid right not a, well so we say solid but rigid is actually the, the better word for it um, man lower mantle and then you have this uh, plasticky liquid upper mantle and then of course you have the crust which is solid now, like I said, we're most concerned with the lithosphere, and um, this averages about 100 kilometers thick, and so really there's nothing that we do with anything underneath the crust except when you have, say, a volcanic eruption or something like that. Okay, so here we have oceanic crust, continental crust. These are going to be important when we start talking about geologic hazards. But first, how is new crust formed? Well, uh, it turns out that we have new crust forming at places where tectonic plates are moving apart, and that is where magma is rising to the surface and is cooling where plates diverge, and that is one. Where plates collide, you're not going to get magma. Um, magma does flow out of volcano, and it does cool, but it doesn't make new crust per se, uh, and that's not really how earthquakes work at all. So. The, none of those are the right answers, number one. So what we're really talking about here when we talk about these geologic hazards is that we are talking about plate tectonics. Now the earth is divided into about 12 major plates but there are fractures all over those plates and this goes back to when I said that the earth was like a glass ball. You can imagine this glass ball and inside you've got a layer of saran wrap and inside that there's a layer of jello and inside that you have uh, like a racquetball and inside that you have like a you know a ball bearing or something. Um, if you drop that on the floor that glass is going to crack and there are going to be big cracks and little cracks and that is really kind of what the crust looks like. Now, because the core is so hot, you get convection currents that set up uh, in the mantle and that drags those plates and it causes them to collide, pull apart, or to scrape against each other. Okay. Now, here are the major plate lines and you can see, I just want to point out this one, this is actually the ring of fire right here and uh, the majority of seismic activity actually occurs along this Pacific plate. All right, so radiation, convection, conduction, or convergence in the mantle and core make the tectonic plates move. This is a little bit of were you paying attention a few seconds ago. If you were, you will know the answer is convection. So plate movement uh, is caused by these big convection cells, and we're going to see convection cells in the ocean, 
in the atmosphere and here in the geosphere. Convection cells are occurring. They are the major drivers of all of the dynamic systems that, that we're going to be talking about throughout the course. Sorry, that was a little, <laughs> little, little thing there. Okay, um, three types of plate boundaries. You have divergent, you have convergent, and you have transform. Divergent, they're pulling apart. Convergent, they're coming together. And transform, they're sliding past each other. Okay, here's a divergent boundary. This is where we're getting new crust, but um, you can al you also get volcanoes, and some of the biggest volcanoes in the world are on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where you have a massive divergent boundary. And Iceland uh, is on part of, is on part of that, and Iceland is tremendously active. If you'll remember, several years ago there was a volcanic eruption that shut down international air travel for two days or so, um, entirely, like all of it. Um, but here are some features in Iceland, and you can see. And we already know that in Iceland they get most of their energy from those uh, seismic features that they have. The the um, geothermal energy that they use so much of. All right, now convergent boundaries, there are three types of these. We're only really interested in the continent-continent and the continent-oceanic crust collisions. And when it comes to geologic hazards, we're most interested in the continent-oceanic crust collision. So that's going to be the one we're going to talk about most. But here's continental-continent, continent-continent, you get um, mountains, right? And then oceanic and continent, you get mountains and volcanoes. And so this is what we're going to be most interested in, and we'll do a lot about volcanoes. So, right, what we have here when we have convergence is we have a process called subduction. The oceanic plate will slide underneath the continental plate, and this will build up friction right here, which can cause earthquakes. Earthquakes are the... Um, is where plates are moving, and friction builds up, and then the plate shifts to relieve that, that pressure. And that's why you get the earthquake. So here we have the subducting slab. This is going to be melting in the mantle. Uh, and this feeds all these magma chambers and eventually causes volcanic eruptions. So volcanoes and earthquakes occur at subduction or converging um, plate boundaries. Volcanoes, occur, but no earthquakes, occur at the diverging boundaries. And um, interestingly enough, at these subduction zones, you get really deep, deep waters, right? And the Marianas Trench is right here, and it's about 11, I think 11 miles deep, something like that. But you get the weirdest stuff down there, right? All kinds of crazy little, little creatures. That's just a fun fact. Okay, now transform boundaries. We're familiar with this one because of the San, Andre the San Andreas Fault, which is a transform fault. And this is just where the plates are sliding past each other. And as they slide past, um, they'll stick, right? That's that friction thing. And then they slip, uh, relieving the pressure, and that's where you get the earthquake. So back to this whole earthquakes, where do earthquakes form? They're going to form here at transform faults. Um, they're going to, that's the transform fault, they're going to form uh, where you have subduction zones, right? And then of course volcanoes are going to uh, rise further inland where you have that subducting slab. Okay, tsunamis, what are those caused by? Well, they're caused by underwater earthquakes. Tsunamis are a function of earthquakes, right? And so the wave that passes through the crust, right, that's what causes the earth to shake. And that's because the pressure is relieved in the earthquake. And we'll talk about this in class. And if you have questions about it, please ask. Um, but when you have that happening underwater, that wave goes through the water. And so you have a tsunami. Now, volcanoes are formed at those same subduction zones where you have earthquakes. So subduction zones kind of have a little bit of everything. And then, of course, review, they are at the converging. Okay, so what is the cause of the ring of fire? The source of more earthquakes and volcanic activity uh, than any other place on Earth. The collision of two continental plates, mid-oceanic ridges, the drift of Europe and Africa away from the Americas plate, or the subduction of Pacific plates under the continental plate. Well, the answer is four. Because you have earthquakes and you have volcanoes, it must be a subduction zone. Okay, And then the rock cycle. Um, how does rock get formed? Well, we have weathering and then we have erosion. Uh, that material that has been eroded is transported somewhere. It is then deposited, which forms sedimentary rock and uh, like sandstone, sandstone and limestone. Um, and then those are 
formed by heat and pressure, and then you get more heat and more pressure, and that will change into metamorphic rocks like slate, marble, uh, gneiss, and quartzite. And then you have that will melt as it goes into the, ma the mantle, which becomes magma, which can then erupt, right? Uh, and as it cools, it forms igneous rocks like granite, pumice, and basalt. So let's talk a little bit about these surfacing pro surface processes. First of all, weathering and erosion are the same. True or false? Absolutely false. That is absolutely false. Uh, weathering is the breakdown of rocks into smaller pieces, right? And those pieces are called sediments. Erosion is the process of those being carried away. They are carried away by wind, gravity, glaciers, and, uh, and running water. Then wherever those sediments end up are getting dropped, uh, that's deposition. They're deposited there, okay? So weathering breaks down the rocks. Erosion moves uh, the particles, the sediment, and deposition places the sediment in another location. So there's a couple of different kinds of weathering. There's physical weathering, and this is the breakdown of rocks and minerals with no change in chemical composition. That can be stuff like uh, plants growing into fractures in rock and separating them apart. Ice will do the very same thing because as the water seeps in and then freezes, the water expands. And then also exfoliation abrasion are types of physical weathering as well. Um, exfoliation abrasion occur when water that has particulates in it flows over and acts like sandpaper. Okay, so that's wedging. Oh, look, I have it twice. Yay. Okay, so the first one is wedging. Exfoliation abrasion are the other two. All right, chemical weathering. This is where you do have a, a change, right? And so the oxid in oxidation, you have oxygen combining with elements. Um, if it's iron, that's rust, right? If you have uh, just regular old chemical weathering, it's the breakdown of rocks by some chemical reaction, uh, and you have this change in the chemical composition. And there are really two types that we want to talk about. Hydration, and that's water dissolving away minerals. And carbonation, that's where carbon dioxide dissolved in water forms carbonic acid, um, which makes an acid rain, which chemically weathers rocks. Okay, um, and here you have the oxidation of the bronze, right, that is, no, copper, sorry, copper, that is the um, Statue of Liberty. And then here you have rust on a um, metal piece that's holding these cables together. And you can actually see that you have rust on the cables too. By the way, if this were something like a suspension bridge, this would be very dangerous because these processes weaken the material actually. Okay, so after we're weathered, we're going to experience erosion, also called transport. There are five main agents. We talked about that. Wind, gravity. We're going to talk about gravity because that's the landslide situation. Glaciers, which carve through the rock, and water, which carves through rock. Okay. Now, it turns out that, that you need to really remember, because people get confused, weathering has to happen before erosion happens. Okay. And here's an interesting thing. You can actually tell... Um, how sort of sturdy, if you will, the rocks are based on how fast they erode. And so a cool place to see this is under waterfalls. You can see that the dolostone here is much uh, more resistant to weathering than shale, whereas limestone uh, versus sandstone, same kind of thing. All right, landslides would be the next geologic hazard. So we've got earthquakes and tsunamis, we've got volcanoes, right, and now we're going to have landslides. And this is not a uh, seismic function, right, it's not a plate tectonic function. This is where you have gravity that has, where you have weakened areas and gravity pulls the material down. And so here's a nice little picture of various kinds of landslides. And then here are some pictures of actual landslides. This is Highway 101 in the Big Sur. And I'm not sure where this is, but I think this picture is amazing because this is a house, the, these are houses, right, and they're falling down the side here. Now, the long sandy islands along the south shore of Long Island are composed mostly of sand and rounded pebbles arranged in sorted layers. The agent of erosion that most likely shaped and sorted the sand and pebbles while transporting them to their island location was ocean waves. So you have this erosion, everything moving, but remember it's going to be deposited somewhere else. So we'll talk a little bit about deposition really quickly. 
this is the um, dropping of the sediments, okay? It's going to depend on the size, the shape, and the density of the sediments, right? Most deposition is going to happen in slow or still bodies of water, like oceans and lakes, which is why you have sedimentary rock underneath, you know, that form where oceans used to be. Um, and the deposition is typically caused by the slowing down of whatever it is that's moving that sediment, the wind or water, most of the time in this case. And it's because you have that loss of kinetic energy, and so it slows down and starts to fall out. All right, and the whole process, weathering erosion, transport, deposition, and then burial, compaction, and lithification. Burial is where it gets covered up by other stuff. Compaction is where it gets squished, and lithification is where you get something turning into stone. All right, that is it for these video notes. If you have any questions, please ask, and in class we will uh, be looking at uh, volcanoes and maybe a little bit about earthquakes as well. All right, thanks for listening, and have a good day.